I'm only presenting what I've learned and studied. Um, David Dan, who had made this lesson, was one of the uh, instrumental people in starting up the East End and West End churches. Him and Shaka Bartlett came to Toronto, and this is how we started the East and West End. So that's how far David and us go back. Uh, he had set up a bunch of these lessons to bring people from whatever point in their beliefs, whether they believe the Bible or they don't believe in baptism or whatever, to bringing them into what the church represents. And so uh, I had the opportunity to present a couple of these lessons to you today. Uh, they're simplistic. Uh, I'm not, I don't have the gift of gab like Jeremy to expound on a lot of things. So most of it I'm going to be just presenting the information. Um, so bear with me. Um, but yeah, I, I thank David for uh, allowing me access to some of his lessons on this. So they're really good, really good lessons for basic teaching that anybody can use and teach other people. So uh, I had offered um, uh, one of our members to choose two topics, and this is one of the topics that they had chosen. So, and the last day. So, what do we think of the last day? You know, we, we get those flyers in our mail, right? First first stuff on sale from Thursday to Wednesday. Well, Wednesday is the last day of the sale, right? But for us, the last day is a little bit different in a religious manner. So, And the last day meaning there is no other day after the last. The last day the last. So let's go through this presentation and uh, see what the Bible says about the last day. So Jesus spoke of one day in the future that will be the last day. And it's referred to the Bible as the last day. Okay, in John chapter 12, verse 40, he says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Okay, John 6, 39 and 40 says, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should rise, raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last, the last day. The history of the earth has covered, has covered thousands and thousands of days, but the last day will mark the end of the history of the world. The last day is referred to in different ways in the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 verses 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 7 and 8, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the re releva rele yeah, excuse me, revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. In Jude 6. And the angels who did not keep their profit, pro proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting change under the darkness of the judgment of the great day. So all these things are going to take place in the last day. Um, Matthew 7, verse 21 and 22. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in the, that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Some of the most important events will take place in the last day, the second coming of Christ. Jesus will come again at the end of time on the last day. His first coming took place when he was born of a virgin in Matthew 1, verse 20 to 25. And, 
Um, did Joseph start at verse 20, 24? Or sorry, 20, 25 here. But while he thought about these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a child, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the, his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with, with child, bearing a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took him at his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn and called his name Jesus. So that's when he was born. After his death and resurrection, he ascended to heaven, and his disciples were told that he will come again. In Acts Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. Now when they had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from heaven, uh, taken from you into heaven, will come so in like manner as you see him going into heaven. So we're told that he will be taken up and coming in the same manner as he was taken up to heaven. The Bible says he will come a second time. Hebrews 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin and salvation. So once again, we're told he's going to be coming a second time. His second coming will be the end. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 and 24, And those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end. He will deliver the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and, author and all authority and power. So at the end, the second coming of Christ, will happen on the last day. There is no other time. No visible warning signs will precede the second coming of Christ. Precede, actually. Uh, many have tried to predict the date of the second coming of Christ, but all predictions have failed. Um, brings to mind the Jehovah Witnesses. They have, I can't remember how many times they had predicted the second coming. People sold their houses and lived in cars. And, well, there's a lot of those people um, don't hear in scripture, but um, if 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 the angels don't know this, when the second coming crisis, who are we to know, right? If we were supposed to know, it would it be in scripture? And so no one knows when he will come again. Uh, Matthew twenty four thirty six. But the day of the Lord, an hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So if the angels don't know, it's not in scripture, then we will never know until that time. First uh, Thessalonians verse uh, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So think about that. Do we know when somebody's going to break into our house? Has anybody had their house broken into? We have. A week, a one week, uh, bought a new VCR. Yes, I'm that old. And uh, come home, my wife wanted to re record the news, and I come in the house and I'm like, VCR gone. Somebody kicked in our steel door in the, in the back of the house. Horrible feeling. But if I knew that thief was going to come to my house that day, I would have stayed home from work. Kind of sounds kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? We don't know when a thief is going to break into. And this is the example of the coming of second coming of Christ. We don't know. But we do. We, when, when we have our house unprotected, we have locks on our doors to secure the locks. We have 
surveillance cameras, some of us. We have alarm systems, right? What does that do? That prepares us for somebody that might break in, right? Well, we also have tools to prepare us for when Christ comes, and that is serving him, being found in him on the last day. So like we protect ourselves from thieves, we also have opportunity to protect ourselves for the coming of Christ, so that we are prepared. That song, prepare to meet thy God, right? So, what's going to happen on the last day? Well, first, the resurrection of the dead. The dead will be raised on the last day. The physical death, the separation of the spirit from the body. James 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. He's comparing uh, works and faith and the dead. Um, no spirit, you're dead. People die. There's a separation with the body and the spirit. The body goes into the grave. The soul or spirit goes into an unseen realm called Hades. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 27. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So when we die, our souls go to Hades. Now, people think of Hades as hell. It's not hell. Uh, sometime another lesson would be good on, on that, to know the difference between hell and Hades. But Hades is where you, our souls go when we die, whether good or bad. Now, the spirit of those who have died physically will be re re reunited with a body and raised from the dead on the last day. The resurrection will take place when Jesus comes on the last day. John 6, verse 39 and 40. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Are we going to be raised in our same mobile body? Well, that's destroyed in the grave. We will get a different body, one uncorruptible. The resurrection will take place when Jesus comes on the last day. John 6, verse 44 45. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Uh, 1 Thessalonians verses, uh, chapter 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Well, where have we saw something preluding that? When the, when the two people said to the disciples that saw Jesus go, they go, come back in like manner. Well, this is the verse. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout of the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will remain and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the dead will rise first, and those who are still living, who are serving God, will be raised to the clouds with Jesus on the last day. All the dead will be raised on the last day. Both the righteous and the wicked will be raised, and at the same time when Christ comes on the last day. John 5, verse 28 29 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the re resurrection of condemnation. So on the last day, when we rise, if we're dead, we have one of two places to go, the resurrection of life or the resurrection of condemnation. Gives us a lot to think about which side of the fence we want to be on for this. Acts 24, verse 15. And there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. What's going to happen on the last day after that? The destruction of the world. The Bible says that the physical universe will pass away. 
God created the physical universe, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus said the physical universe will be destroyed. Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no means pass away. The physical universe will be destroyed on the last day. 2 Peter verses, chapter 3, verse 10 and 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. That's like the whole world being destroyed. Fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of, w of which the heavens will be dissolved by being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? So there's nowhere to escape at that time. The earth, the earth and the universe will be destroyed. The physical realm will be done away with on the last day when Christ comes. After that, we have final judgment. Everyone will be judged by God on the last day. The Bible often refers to the last day as the day of judgment. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the last day of judgment. Matthew 12, verse 26. When we go to court, we have to plead our case, right? Well, we're going to be pleading our case to God, right? He's going to judge us whether we've done good or bad while we're alive. Because after the last day, you really can't change your lifestyle. At that time, it's too late. Every person will be judged by the words of Jesus on the last day. Uh, John 12, 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So what this is alluding to is we need to listen to the word of Jesus and follow his word. Because that's what's going to judge us. How do you serve Jesus? Well, you follow his word. If you're not following his word, you're not following Jesus. No one will be able to avoid this final judgment on the last day. Matthew 25, verse 31 and 32. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he'll sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he'll separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. It's another example of uh, being separated from the good and the evil for life eternal or life in condemnation. No one will be able to escape this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So, for we must all. That not only pertains to Christians, it pertains to everybody. What else happens in the final judgment? Each person will receive a just reward on the last day. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. That kind of reminds me of the parable of the talents. The one was given ten talents. He was given ten more you know, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in thy uh, master's place. And then the five, he he also made five, and the one buried his because he's afraid of losing it. And he was considered wicked because he didn't at least deposit it with the bankers to gain interest. So everybody's going to be divided uh, into our works according to good or evil. Matthew 25, 46, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal life. Those who have not been forgiven of their sins will face everlasting punishment in hell. Those who have been faithful to God will dwell with him in heaven for eternity. There is no third option. All those scriptures we read, good and evil, separation, sheep and goats. There were sheep, goats, and rabbits. 
there weren't good, evil, not so bad. Right? There's no third option in this. It's one of the two. The last day will be the day of both joy and sorrow. Well, people who, who go into everlasting, eternal life could have joy and sorrow because they could be sorry for their family members who didn't listen to them while they pleaded all these years and were told not to, not to talk about religious subjects. Or you could be sorrowful that you, you missed the boat and fell into the judgment of condemnation. Those who are saved will have a great joy. Those who are lost will have endless sadness. Many who believe they are saved will learn that they are actually lost on the last day. And there's a lot of people who think that they're good people. And there are people who are good. They don't harm people. They don't steal. They don't cheat on their taxes. But if they're not following Christ, then they're still going to miss the target because this is all about following Christ. Matthew 7, verse 21 and 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, passed out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How many religions are there out there? A thousand, maybe more. Right? They all they all say Lord Lord on Sundays. They all preach. Well, that's we're gonna be doing that one um, after after the break. So we're gonna learn a little bit about denominationalism. But all these all these ones think that they're right, but at the end of the day, who's gonna judge them? Jesus. What else happens on the last day? Uh, so the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead. The destruction of the world, the final judgment. So, are we ready for the last day? Wow, that was fast. So, any comments? We got to take a couple minutes for our comments. On that. It's a serious topic. We need to really focus on where we are in our lives because, you know, I. I I like to bring up my mother in uh, some of these topics. Uh, she was Jehovah Witness, and it's not to put her down in any way. She had very strong beliefs, but she died in the Jehovah Witnesses. And uh, she used to come down to, they have these great conventions in Toronto where they baptized 3,000 in one day, making it seem like some miracle or something like that. And uh, so, she, she came home one Saturday, and she's saying that, yeah, they baptized 3,000 one day, and, uh, and I, I was setting her up. Well, I knew she'd get mad at me for this, but I had to make a point. And um, I said, wow, that was amazing. Preaching was, must have been really good. And then the next day, Sunday, she came back, and I said, hey, um, how'd it go? Oh, great. How many were baptized? None. I said, none? Wait a minute. You went from 3,000 yesterday to none today? What happened? Was the preaching bad? The point was, is that they plan to do this. So somebody wants to learn the Bible and they want to be baptized today. They can't. They have to wait for one of these grand conventions. So they make it look like they baptize a whole bunch at the same time. So what, ha what happened was on the next day, well, they didn't plan for that. So everything, everything was planned ahead of time, all through that year or, or six months, whatever it took for that. So all those people who wanted to be baptized between they heard the word and not, and we know that when we hear the word and we want to be baptized, we will baptize you right away, right? Because who knows if, if we have tomorrow. So I brought the, the point up. I said, well, what about if somebody wants to be baptized? I knew her answer already. I've studied the Jehovah Witnesses. I've taught on the Jehovah Witnesses and their error. And she says, well, they'd have to study and do all these courses and basically wait for the next uh, convention. And I said, well, what would happen if the guy walked out of the building, unsaved, gets hit by a car and dies? Would he, would he go to God? And it hit, a, it hit a soft point with her. She wasn't too happy. But the Bible clearly speaks that if we die and we're not saved, 
then we're dead. We have to suffer eternal condemnation. So just just a point from a family member. It bothered me to say that, but I, I had to hit hard to get that point across to her, but didn't swear. She still had her faith. She believed that, uh, you know, we have a loving God. Yes, we do, but we have a loving God who expects expects us to follow his, his word and his will, right? As parents, do we not punish our children when they're bad? Do we say, oh, no, it's okay, keep on doing that? No, we teach our children. We expect them to obey. Well, God expects us to obey too, right? So on that point, uh, there's no comments or questions. Not that I'd be able to answer everything, but... <laughs> I think part of the people with us in our daily lives, we, we acquire a bad habit of putting things off. You know, well, I'll do that job later, I'll, I'll do this in a bit. But for Christians, we need to remind ourselves, even though baptized, we need to continue to be faithful and to grow. And we can't put this off. like. You know, we can't say, well, I'm going to get a little bit older, you know, next year. Um, I'm going to get a little more strength to speak to others. Or I'm going to get it out of my system now while I'm young. And, well, yeah. You but know? The fact is, what happens to Christ comes before that time. We're still going to be judged. Our, our lives can change in an instant. Uh, one example... When I was uh, in my wicked teens, wild out of control, right? We were out doing things we shouldn't be doing on a motorcycle, had an accident, three months in the hospital. But that wasn't the what that wasn't as much scary part. Even though I could have died that night, I met somebody, a young man. I think he was maybe sixteen at the time. In the hospital paralyzed from the neck down couldn't breathe on his own he had a breathing machine so if that ever stopped that's the end of his life basically and I got to know him and it's like how life can change in an instance he he got into that situation from a car accident we don't know I mean who would expect 16 year old to be bedridden for the rest of his life I'm sure that never crossed his mind right so as the Bible teaches that when we're and when we know the truth and we're old enough to understand the truth and the consequences of not knowing the truth and consequences of knowing the truth that that's the time we need to obey there's no excuses beyond that so if we have not obeyed the gospel when we know the truth and we walk out of here today and God forbid something bad happens there's no do-over there you can't go to God and say, well, yeah, I, um, I was thinking to do that next Sunday. Right? That's why when somebody like, uh, when um, Annette wanted to be baptized, we all went over to Tim's house. And we baptized Annette that same day. Because there's urgency in it. There's urgency. Cal and I almost lost our life coming home from Goderich one night. Literally, we escaped it within inches. We were coming down the high, three-lane highway, um, heading down towards the 401, and there was a me in the faster lane, truck right beside us, neck and neck, and a white car beside the transport truck. And as a biker, I'm kind of predicting like 10 chess moves ahead on how the traffic's reacting because we always have to prepare for the worst outcome as a biker. And something told me out of my mind that something bad is going to happen. And there's bumper to bumper. This, the car behind me was probably a meter behind me. So I couldn't hit my brakes without causing an accident. So I slowed down. I, I, I literally just let off the gas in my car and let traffic slow down behind me. And as soon as I let off my gas, I'm starting to move back a little bit more towards the cab of the truck, more towards the trailer. And as I did that, this white car out of nowhere went perpendicular across the highway. It looked like he probably blew a tie rod or something like that, because cars can't move that direction normally. 
transport truck, then hit him, jammed on his brakes. And now he's, as I'm backing up, the transport truck's going like this, jackknifing into my lane, right? And then the car, come, this is a guardrail coming this way. So now I got two vehicles coming at me like this as I'm backing up. And as they came to a complete stop, I still kept going. And I, my mirrors were like this far from each vehicle and I went straight on through home. Scared the daylights out of her, but as a biker, I have to prepare for escape routes, right? So I felt something was wrong. I made space for an emergency, and that's exactly what I did. And thank God nothing bad happened to us. All the cars behind us did not get into an accident because I didn't slam on my brakes. Could have been a huge accident. Now, if I left a minute earlier, I probably would never have seen that. And if I left a minute later, I would have been stuck in traffic all the way home. But the time it just happened, it was just like synchronized swimming, you know? Like, I mean, that's literally very close to having a serious accident. But we went, we went home, straight on home, didn't stop, you know? Can't panic in that situation. But we, this, this is why our lives are so short that we have to prepare. I saw, I saw something that's possibly in danger and I prepared myself now, that doesn't guarantee me, but I did my part to prepare myself for whatever is going to come next, right? And we have to prepare our lives in such a way that we need to prepare what may happen once we step out this door. If we're Christians and we have not lived that life, we need to make it right now. If we're not Christians and we're not living that life, we need to make it right now. So long as we have opportunity, we need to take advantage of the opportunity. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Jeff? When you talk about being unprepared, uh, really it's about uh, um, having that proper uh, fear of being unprepared for something. It's being unprepared for consequences that come. Uh, in my life, I can make it many times that a healthy fear of consequences uh, has uh, caused me to be prepared for things. Um, but as we've seen in First Thessalonians, it talked about the return of the Lord. Uh, for those who are prepared, there is a comfort in knowing uh, what is coming. Uh, it says, uh, you read it, but it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, this, this kind of lesson that you provided is a comfort. Comfort for us. Here. Uh, but those who are unprepared, it's not such a comfort. But it reminds us why we live the way we live and do the things we do and say the things that we say. Because we have that comfort. If we, if we knew a thief was going to break in, we would make sure that we're there to catch him, right? But we don't have that luxury of knowing what's down the road, right? We don't, if, if we knew when Christ was coming, if he's coming at midnight tonight, I'm sure there'd be a lot more people serving him all of a sudden, right? But we don't. So people are either don't believe, don't care, or just content in how they are. Better to be prepared each day. So it's it's like the um, the ten virgins and their lamps. Which ones were re prepared? The ones that, the ones that were had their all lamps, lots of oil, extra oil, you know. And the, the five that didn't, their lamp went out, and they were trying to get from the other five. And it's like, no, it's too late. You should have been prepared. So let's think about that as we you know go through life. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend.